terms of this, this particular series, it's not our final class by any means, uh, but uh, it's the final of this group. Um, and I have a couple of announcements, but first I have a question, and this question is only to be answered by people who have never kept bees before. Tell me what the major botanical thing is that's going on in Kitsap County right now. Someone who's never kept bees. Maple. Maple. Okay, more detail. We got to really know. Big leaf maple nectar flow is happening right now. Okay, if you've seen, you know, if you have big leaf maple, you know it because they have big leaves. Well, Duh. And they have a <coughs> whitish colored. Um, Thing called yeah, it's, it's really a tassel of flowers that comes down, and you will learn as you drive around your neighbors that ooh, there's a big one, ooh, there's a big one, ooh, there's a close big one, because those are the things that your bees are going to want next year when they come back, and, and it will be one of the first major nectar flows of the year. Uh, this will give them a big blob of nectar into which they can make honey and more bees. Um, now, of course, if you have not kept bees before and you are getting a package, package day is the 18th of April, am I right? Yes. Yes, 18th of April. We will demonstrate all day long. George, how often are we demonstrating a package day? On package day, we'll probably have demos starting at 9 up through noon on about half yeah, hour. Noon or one, yeah. So please come by. If you've never put in a package before, it will be much easier to do if you've seen it done. Trust me on that. So, <coughs> so that's going to be your first real moment with the bees. You get to encounter the, your first 15,000 a long month ago. So you really want to check it out. Uh, yeah, 90 is a pretty good one. If we have more, we'll continue on that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, that, so package day is the 18th. It's a Saturday. If you really want to come and get it, say, if it is raining or nasty, you can, if it's like this, you wait for this particular moment when it's actually not raining and dump them in. Try not to dump them in during the rain. We'll talk about all sorts of things there. But anyway, because package day happens after Big Leaf Maple is over, what are you going to have to do to your bees? Yeah. You're going to have to feed them. You must feed your packages. If you do not feed your packages in Kitsap County, they will die. That's all there is to it. But for those of us who are natural beekeepers, you know it's a hard fact to learn, but yes, you want to feed them. Now, what are you going to feed them? White sugar mixed with water. White sugar mixed with water. One to one ratio. One to one's good, yep. Yeah. Well, whatever you can make milk. <laughs> okay. Um, two best places to get sugar are Costco or, or um, yeah, Cash and Carry. Sure. Unless you know another place where it's cheap, basically what you're looking for is the cheapest per pound sugar. If you are a an anti um, um, GMO sure. person, avoid sugar beet and get cane sugar. Otherwise, get whatever's white that's online. Um, but do not. Why don't you feed them brown sugar? Because it's dysentery. Dysentery is the answer. They'll get dysentery. How will you know your bees have dysentery? The poop all over the front of the hive. <laughs> And you'll notice that. Okay, um, so so that's that's so much this stuff. Package orders. I think tomorrow is the last day to get the Stephens. Right now, all they have is Italians for offer because all the Carniolans are gone. But that's okay. Italians are good to start with. Um, another thing, there will be a board meeting, a meeting of the actual board of this of this whole operation at Stephens, 6 p.m. Uh, next. Tuesday, okay? Same as this class, only it will be as tough as Sedman's. Everyone is invited. You can watch us conduct our business. Board is misspelled, okay? It's B-O-R-E-D, okay? Oh, you could make it. Hey, where are those Okay, if you finish all your tests tonight, they'll be at the board meeting. If you do not finish all your tests, they'll be at the board meeting so you can pick them up and finish them. Please finish them tonight if you can. Yes. Six o'clock! <coughs> Okay. So be almost the same. It'll be up at Stedman's. Is there anyone who does not know where Stedman's bee supply, honey, and other good stuff is? Up the hill. Here in the corner by the high school, it's across from there. Um, 
Question. Uh, what about parking? What about parking? Parking sucks. I mean, uh, um, <laughs> one of the things you can do is park at the high school parking lot across the street from Stedman. There's a lot of parking there, and it's all open at that time of night. Okay. Unless they're having a game. You can also park on the grass at Stedman's. Yeah, you can park on the grass at Stedman's. If there's a lot of us, it will fill up. It would never hold as many cars as this, this bunch of people would generate, but the high school parking lot will hold them. Okay. okay. The lower lot. Okay. Yeah. Basically, you'll be driving along, and Stedman's will be over here on your left, and the high school parking lot turning will be essentially on your right. It's pretty hard to miss. You maybe drive past the high school, and then there's an area where you'll see a bunch of empty parking spaces. Or oh, Stedman? Oh yeah. Okay, that's tricky. Um, <laughs> you get to the right place, and then you turn left. <laughs> And, and I have a hard time seeing there. Unfortunately, it will be light, so you'll be able to see it. But it's before you get to Stedman's, okay? Because after Stedman's, there's the house, and that's a little garage parking area, and that's, that's really small. Where you want to turn is before you actually get to Stedman's, but after the house before it. And down the road. Just a quick um, Somebody just clipped a, a blue pickup and a black pickup car from the parking lot. Oh, so if you, if you have one, you might want to go out there and check it out. They are quarterly, quarterly, the first Monday, twice the third Monday, but there's, there's, there's no particular about that. Sort of Two slots left. 
said that? Somebody did. I check my beans once a week. Every, because that's how my time. So every Sunday I dedicate to going to do my beans and I, and I spend time on my beans on Sunday, Saturday or Sundays. Um, I feed my beans once a week, every Sunday. But I mix my feed one to one. So it's quite different. But I know that my hives that I'm feeding are so strong, I know from experience they're going to take a lot of feed in three days. I know that. Now, my weak hives, I only fill my feet are about half full. So I can look at it. When I talk about a, the strength of a hive, I talk about as far as the frames go. We measure bees by frames. Right now, my beehives are about eight frames, at least eight frames of bees. So I have my boxes. I run nine frame boxes, a regular standard box, which holds ten. When you start out, you're going to run ten frames of um, foundation. And uh, you're going to have 10 frames, because that's how they, they draw it out really well, in 10 frames. But I run 9 frames. I crowd them together so I have space in the side of the nine. But I know that when I feed my bees and my strong eyes, I'll fill up feed up and will be gone in 3 days. I know that. From experience. You'll know that in a few years. Yes? So just as a rule of thumb, if you have feed left over at the end of the week, you dump it and put in new I do. I always do. Yeah. Sugar's cheap. Yeah. Yeah. It's dysentery, so I don't. I usually if, they, if they're if they're not taking it, there's a reason why. And what else? So pollination. Let's go into pollination now, because it also correlates with feeding. And I have 15 minutes. I have 13 and a half minutes. So pollination. Pollination is transfer pollen from the anthers, male parts to the stigmas, female parts to flowers. That's fantastic. Everybody knew that? That's great. We'll move on. Um, I don't, I study flowers. I love flowers. I know what flowers my bees are bringing in. I study the, the pollination. Pollination, my bees, when I go down my bee yards, I look at my, I can walk, the first thing I do in my bee yards, I walk down the front of my beehives. I go down, I get my smoker going, it's smoking, I walk down in front of my beehives, and I look at all how they're doing. That's the first thing I do, I make an observation. I look at what they're bringing in, I see how they're flying. If I see a beehive that's not flying, I mark it. I usually pull some grass up and put a stick on top of that beehive. So when I start working my beehives, for me, I, that one I'll go to it and see what's going, something's going on. Because they should all consistently be the same. And I look to see the, the pollen they're bringing in. I see them flying, I see them coming in with orange or yellow. I know the flowers that are out there. I know the dandelions. Right now, the head of stuff. The maples. Maples are big on nectar. I don't know the color of pollen for the maples. Has they been to a pollen of maple? Yellow. Jason, do you know? Pale yellow. Pale yellow. Pale yellow. Pale yellow. I believe that. Um, so pale yellow for maple. <coughs> but I see them. I look at my hives, and they all to be relatively consistent. And the pollen, bringing in pollen. I know that they've got brood, because the pollen's for the brood, okay? So if, what are the old bees? The older bees eat. Have you know? They don't need pollen. Honey. honey. They eat the honey. And the pollen's for the, the, the new bees, the, the little, um, oh, they make the little mess down the bottom of the cell. So, uh, what do they say? It is estimated that 8% of fruit and seeds crops are pollinated by honeybees. When foraging, each honeybee will concentrate, oh, that's what I want to do, will concentrate on one plant. So, how do they transfer the pollen between plants for cross pollination? That's a great question. Um, make a visit to your bloomy trees when they are buzzing, and I suggest that. I walk around, I pollinate a lot of orchards. And I walk around the orchards to see if my bees are working the trees. I do it all the time. I walk around where my bees are. I walk around look at night, and I see what they're bringing in. I see if they're working those trees. Um, they don't like oranges that much. They like they'd rather have maple over orchards. Um, when I say orchard fruit trees, um, but the willows are good. The willows and the strobus or whatever is full of pollen. There are a lot of plants that just give pollen and not nectar. Scotch broom is a great one. They'll come in covered in yellow. When the sky comes, I see the sky comes just starting to bloom. And they'll come in covered in yellow. But they don't get any nectar from the sky But lots of pollen. One of the things I have found, 
that in the last probably five years I've seen it, or I've noticed it, is that typically in a beehive, I'll have one frame or maybe two frames on the outside. They always put the pollen, in, but the second frame in. Usually the outside frame gets nothing until it's about July or August. They start, they go, they get, it gets warm enough to put stuff in the outside frame. But the second frame in is where they put their pollen in. Now I have noticed, if you have a hive, if you get a, um, a, a package, or however you eat your hive, and you fill full bees your hive, and after a month or so, you start seeing several frames filling for pollen, you have a problem. And I have had hives where they have filled five, six, seven frames of pollen. And that normally is because the queen is gone. And there's a working layer. Or a laying worker. <laughs> laying worker. Working layer. So make a visit, blooming trees. Uh, large colonies have greater need for pollen. And that's simple science there. There's more population, they need more pollen. And more workforce available to gather pollen. Uh, many farmers are willing to pay beekeepers for pollination services, and typically, if I get asked to put my bees, that's, that's a great one there, um, I get asked to put my bees in someone's orchard. Gas prices are high. I'm not going to move one beehive, because if it's, if it's a couple miles away, that's fine. If it's 20 or 30 miles away from one beehive, I'm not going to do this. I want to, but it's going to cost them money for my, to, to put them. If they want to pollinate the fruit trees, I usually put, I don't know, I usually put a minimum of about five hives. And it's going to cost them to put them there. So I usually get, there was an orchard in Tacoma uh, University Place. It's a, uh, it's a park. Um, I just pollinate there, 40 bucks a hive. And the almonds, I was getting 200 bucks a hive. And about 180 dollars a hive. They're still getting about, it's probably right now, the, the new report's about 180 to 250 a hive. But it's a lot of work involved. It works out about negative 10 cents a hour. <laughs> um, providing pollination is not cash, but also stress to the bees. And I hear that all the time about moving bees and stress. I don't know. I move my bees. People ask about moving bees. Um, I move them a lot. I don't know what stress is about. Um, they, I have a psychotic doctor that you see. They get stressed out. Uh, it was balanced risk and rewards. And that's what you have to do because it's always take into consideration the travel and gas, traveling your time, whatever your time is worth. Um, be familiar with the laws and rules pertaining to migratory beekeeping and renting hives pollination. Okay. Um, many beekeepers collect pollen, and I do that. So I chose this topic because I do run pollen traps. I run about 30 pollen traps. I get, I see my bees and fancy also. When I move my bees in the mountains, I put my pollen traps up the mountains, and I run about 30 pollen traps. I collect about 500 pounds of pollen every time I see my bees. What's so cool about pollen traps, because my pollen traps, again, my beehive should be relatively all consistent. A pollen trap uh, drawer that holds pollen is about twice the size of that book. This that thickness, a little thicker, about that size. My bees will fill that up in pollen in three days. I'll collect my pollen, I'll get five, I'll get two to three hundred pounds of pollen every trip. I sell my pollen for five dollars a pound. Last year it was five bucks a pound. Um, I have this a big health food store with the health foods, people buy it for whatever. It tastes like alpha. Anybody had pollen before? He beat pollen? I've had uh the capsules. They good? I like them. Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's great. You guys have pollen? You like that too? That's handy. Oh yeah. Because you get acclimated to the environment. Yeah. It, it is. It was good for that. And what is what's so neat about pollen traps is that I can look at my. I pull the doors open. I pull the tray out. I mine are the front end uh, drawers, and I can see. Usually when they, I can tell what they're bringing in. And some create some some will be full of orange, some will be full of black, and the colors of pollen tells me the flowers are getting off of. And I know that if when I go down my pollen traps and when I'm cleaning them out, if one has they're all typically they're all full after about three or four days, from about uh, middle of July through 
end of August, I'll pull my traps off about the end of August, the pollen starts tapering off. And when they end, but I, every time I pull my pollen trap open, and some of them, they only have a couple of granules, I know I got a problem with that beehive. Two things, one or two things. Either one, I got a problem with that beehive, or the bees are smart. Because the pollen traps have little exit, they have a little hole in the side of them. And the smart bees know how to get past the pollen trap and go into the beehive. And some of my beehives, some of the, the colonies, they, they get clever. They, they figure that out really fast and they tell everybody, don't go through that screen. Because they go through a screen which breaks the pollen off their, their hands. Am I running out of time? I got two minutes? Two minutes. Two minutes. <coughs> so anyway, it did, it, so pollen traps tell me a lot. And I do pollen traps because I can make a patient my gas in my living sense an hour. So pollination, and here's a chemistry lesson. Everybody knows this here? Okay, great. Um, what is pollen? Pollen's all kinds of high, uh, high proteins. Pollination is a great graph. I've studied this for days, and this is fantastic. So um, we'll go on here, and we get, I don't think the new guy gets it, which is all you people in those bee suits, and queen management. There we go. Next. Any questions before I walk out of here? I'm going to come back and do honey in a little bit. Yes, sir? So you mentioned that the tables are preferable for bees now. Unfortunately, we live where a lot of trees. How do they take to alder and cedar? Zero. <laughs> Probably propolis, maybe off the cedar. But nothing, I don't know what's off the alder. Anything off the alder? They don't, they don't seem to get nearly as excited as we do about it. Aspirin, maybe or something. I don't know what's all going on. No, no. Maples. Don't find maples. There's maples everywhere. Even when you want to grow. Yes? <coughs> I think you can sell everything at Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of Any other questions? I'll be back every single time for that. Oh, does that work? Yeah. Oh, I guess I do know how to fix it. Thank you. Is that the proper volume? No. A little higher. Is that louder? A little higher. Rotate the knob. It's all the way up. Oh, that's disturbing. <laughs> that's all okay. Right. It's that, all the way up. Is that any good? Yeah. Okay, where's the clicker? No, I know why. It's hard to see. Do I do that? No. How do I make it work? Like that? There we go. That's not the right page. Did you see this one? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Jane, okay. can you move that mic over a little bit the other side, I think? Up a little bit closer, up the higher. It's got to be about four inches from your mouth. There you go. Better? Better. All right. Queen, so I'm going to talk a little bit about queen management and uh, queen rearing. <coughs> so, Queens are kind of important. Without, without queen, you're not going to have a colony for very long. Uh, the queens produce all the babies in the hive. Uh, they also produce pheromones that create a sense of well-being and happiness in the colony. The pheromones do a lot. It's, it's all about the, the chemicals uh, with bees. They, they, they communicate a lot with chemicals. They receive various information from different pheromones and chemicals. So if you run out of queens, you're going to run out of bees. Uh, if, if your queen fails to produce, is, is failing, uh, and is unable to produce viable eggs, your colony is going to slowly decline. If she's uh, got some kind of a genetic mutation or inability in any way, she's the one bee that is crucial. The rest of them are, uh, for lack of a better word, expendable. So what happens when the, the queen is failing? You guys can answer this. Swarm cells or supersede your cells? So a swarm cell is the, the method by which the colony will reproduce itself. They've decided that they want to reproduce another colony. The supersede your cell is when the queen is failing and the colony says, oh my god, we have to take what we can and make a new queen. So what do you need to have in order to have viable reproducing queens is uh, a lot of resources and some drones. 
drones provide half of the genetic makeup for the queens to produce, the eggs that the queens might produce. If, uh, so the timing, the timing is a little bit critical, a little bit critical, oxymoron. If you are to have success raising your queens, you need to do it in the time of year when the bees are able to do so. Is December a good time to raise queens? No pollen, no nectar, no stores coming in, and there's no drones to mate with. So what you're going to want to do is raise your queens when the season and the bees are prepared to do so. Uh, most beekeepers will replace their queens every year or two, especially uh, commercial beekeepers. Uh, oh, this is a good one. Um, queens, so we use a nucleus colony to test out a queen. So we will start with a new queen that we have perhaps raised and give her just a couple frames to see how viable she is. She might be a dud, in which case you don't want to give her two beeps full of bees, you're going to have a disaster she can't produce and keep them going. So the, the timeline for queens. Uh, queens spend the least amount of time in the, brood, in the, the comb. So the egg will be laid in three days, it will hatch into a larva, and the queen cell will be capped at eight days, and then at 16 days she will emerge from her comb. She will then spend the next couple weeks, hopefully the weather is suitable and there are plenty of drones to select from. If your queen hatches and you have monsoon season, which we have around here, you are not going to get a native queen. So the queen will then take a couple of weeks after she emerges to go on maiden voyage flights to mate with drones when the weather's nice, and then she'll come back and she stays there unless she swarms. We, let's see, I think I skipped something important there. So after a few weeks, she should, it's when she begins laying, that's, that's a rainbow view of things. She, she hopefully will begin laying. <coughs> Marking your queens. Uh, very important, I find that very important. It's, uh, it makes things so much quicker to locate. I mean, you can spend a lot of time looking for your queen on frame, or you pull a frame out, bingo, there she is, right there. Stands out like a sore thumb. The, the years are color coordinated. We use five different colors and repeat every five years. So that's, that's the, so this year we end in five, so we're marking our queens blue. Last year was green, next year will be white. Queen introduction into a new colony is when you are introducing a queen that does not belong to that colony, you maybe have a failed queen that you're replacing, or she died, or you took a couple frames of bees and you're trying to start a new colony, and you're introducing a queen, or you have a package colony. So with a package colony, those queens don't belong to those bees. What they do with package colonies is they ship all Jerry's bees down to California, for the almond flow, and then we order package bees, and they shake all those bees out into a big water trough, and they scoop them up with a feed scoop, and they dump them into a package, and they give them a strange queen, and they send them to us. So they're coming from tropical weather, and we bring them up here, and we freeze them and drown them. So is there any wonder why we have challenges? But there are ways to get around that. One would be to rear your own queens that exhibit a propensity to, fur, uh, to thrive in this environment. We're looking for web-toed bees. If anybody sees any, let us know. We'll breed them. Swarm cells. Uh, if you're going to, so you would start a new colony with swarm cells, or you could use supersede your cells, although we don't recommend it, because generally speaking, the swarm cells are the ones that the bees have chosen that are good and viable. The supersedure cells are the, the queens that may not be the best because they were an emergency. They're, they were sort of a last resort. We'll take it because we have to. All right. So what do we got here? Here's a lovely queen cell. A little queen coming out. Should shoot a little hole out here. And pop off the lid and shut them out. Here's a queen in here with some attendants to take care of her. And this could be how you get your queen. This is a, a sort of queen cage that there's many styles of queen cages. 
Uh, if you're starting a new colony, the, the quickest way to have brood is to use a laying queen, not a surprise unmated queen that you don't know her abilities. If you, if you start with you know, one of these queens, this newly emerged queen, it's going to take you three, six weeks before she's producing brood, uh, before she's producing eggs. It will take her time to mature, let her wings dry out, let her eyes get focused, and then go on her mating flights and get mated, and that will depend largely on the weather and various conditions and availability of drones. And then she will come back and start laying, hopefully. Okay, queen rearing. Queen rearing is when you grow queens deliberately. Although you can accidentally grow queens. Um, anybody can grow queens. You can first year beekeepers. And you can get in over your head and grow lots of queens. Which is lots of fun. There's a lot of different methods to trick your bees. The, most of what we do with beekeeping is sort of tricking bees or manipulating bees to do what we want them to do. So queen rearing is all about manipulating the bees to do what we want them to do. So we create various conditions inside the hive that cause them to have that red alert, we need a queen, so they become very receptive to raising queens. If you raise your own queens, you can save a lot of, mostly stress. Uh, it's not really about the money. Queens you can get, you know, 10, 20, 30 bucks, whatever. Sometimes you can get 500 on a queen if you are into that. But uh, <laughs> for the most part, you can get a cheap queen who is just fine. You can raise your own queens. If you run out of queens this time of year, you might be in a panic situation. Where are you going to get a queen in March? So raising your own queens answers that question for you. So it's not about spending the $10, it's about the time that it takes to recover your colony. The best time of year to raise queens is when they naturally want to raise themselves, is in the summertime. You need, uh, to, in order to raise a queen, you will need eggs. We don't really use eggs, but uh, you could use eggs if you were not going to move them. We would normally wait for the egg. Oh, I'll get to that. Okay, so we'll talk about grafting, which is when you move the larva. You could also use existing comb and eggs and move them in such a way that the bees will draw them out of your queen cells. So you need lots of pot. So the, did somebody talk about how much bees are fed? Worker bees in the comb are fed a couple hundred times a day. Worker queen, or excuse me, queens in the comb are fed several thousand times. So, if you think about the feeding and the nurse bees who are doing that feeding, you have to have a lot of nurse bees to feed queens. So if you're raising multiple queens in a colony, you need a lot of nurse bees to eat a lot of food. Bees eat a lot of pollen. And you would also need, if you're going to be raising queens, you need enough worker bees in there to keep the, the, the heat, you know, regulate the heat. And you also need plenty of drones around. Drones, drones are un, uh, undervalued. If you don't have drones, you don't have bees. Drones may be labeled as the freeloaders, but without them, you're up a creek. The, the, the most important thing here, um, aside from good flying weather in order to get your, your queen mated, is that if you're going to try to trick your bees into raising a queen, is that they think they need a queen. If they don't think they need a queen, no matter what you do to them, you're not going to convince them. So you have to trick them. So, let's see. Here's a method. This is real simple. We, uh, we were looking at one of these in the apiary this afternoon. And I would call this a walk-away split. So what we started with was two deep boxes last fall, last May, and they were just full of bees. And we said, great, they're doing so wonderful, let's make two. So we took one box off, gave it a bottom board and a cover, and just waited. Didn't inspect, didn't look to see where the queen was, just leave it alone. Just split those two boxes. She's in one of those boxes. In a week, we'll know which one she's in. 
So come back a week later, you see which hive is happy and which hive has swarm cells or supersede cells. That's one method. So then this, you know, the colony without the queen will then raise a queen provided you gave them some young bird or eggs. That's one key you may want to cover. If, if, uh, if you come back a week later, this says a month, but I wouldn't wait a month because you're losing production every week because that's all you're going to need, need to figure out if they decided it was going to work or not. If it doesn't work, if they didn't, if you for some reason didn't have young larvae in there or eggs and they were not able to raise a queen, that colony will be queenless and you can just recombine the boxes. If you were successful, you now have two colonies and another queen. Real simple, just a walk away split. Here's another method. Uh, if your bees already are ready to swarm, you can take advantage of that. If they're ready to raise a queen. Great, near, whoa, sorry. Uh, just help facilitate that. So you could remove, so here we have, what's this? All right, what's that? That's a swarm cell. It's up, up in the comb. These ones are low. Oh, walk backwards, I'm sorry. You're right, that's, <laughs> that's a super procedure. This is a swarm. So, you could take those. This is, the, this is the colony saying, I'm ready. But they, may, they still have a queen in their colony. And they're going to swarm. Once they decide they're going to swarm, they're going to swarm. You're, you're not really going to stop them. I mean, you can plug up the colony if you want to. You can, there are various methods you can employ. Most of them don't really work that well. Uh, I sometimes will cage the queen. I'll take a, a framed comb out, and I have a, I'll have make a wire cage, and I'll just squish it into the wax with her and some attendants in there, and keep her in there. So if she's trapped, they can't swarm. Dirty trick, but it works. You may have to do it multiple times. You may have to get that queen out of there. There's all kinds of little tricks you can do. Uh, so you can take these frames and put them into a nucleus colony. Did somebody discuss a nucleus colony? So a little small, even it's a little partial box of frames. It could have two frames in it. It could have five or whatever you want. They tend to have four or five. You give them, you take those two frames, or whatever you have, with the swarm cells or supersedure cells, preferably swarm cells, and you put them in the box with a bunch of workers and nurse bees, and let them raise that queen, and come back and see if she starts to lay eggs in a few weeks. So, here's another method. There's, there's lots of tricks. You could take Say you have that double leaf I was talking about over here. You can put a, a queen excluder, sort of a fancy queen excluder, between the two boxes and allow them to do their thing. And then you slide a solid piece of metal in there, a piece of sheet metal, so that the bees are separated. The two boxes stacked on top of each other, but they can't mingle. So one of those boxes is going to think it's queenless and draw out comb, or draw out uh, queen cells. So you've started another, you started another colony that way. Is there a place for the bees to come in and out from both? Yes, that, that queen excluder has, it's sort of a, a hybrid between a bottom board and a queen excluder, so that it allows the top box entrance. Grafting. Now here's where, this is where the bees, we skip the bees for one step. So we choose the larva. We choose a frame that has three day old or less <coughs> larva. And we take these little tools, you see this little tiny tool here, and dip into the comb and pick up a little larva and put it in this cup. And I've got some of these in here. So what happens then, you start with these little plastic cups, you put your little larva in there, you put them on these wooden bars that is the shape of a frame, but it's, it doesn't have wax or comb on it, it's just got little wooden bars, plug these into it. 
You put that inside of your, your donor colony, and they will decide if you did any good or not. And if you did good, they will grow you a queen. And if you didn't, they'll clean it out. And you'll come back the next day, it'll be the next day, 24 hours later, and get your report card from bees. <laughs> and if you're lucky, they will grow you morels in there instead. <laughs> so, let's see, where are we? So, so they, they'll tell you within 24 hours what, what they think of the larva you chose by drawing a cell around it. And you can then take that cell and put it into a nucleus colony, a queenless nucleus, co nucleus colony, and that they will then raise that queen. And once they start to raise the queen cell out, they will finish it. They, they won't abandon it. And you can grow a lot. So that bar that I'm talking about, you put a hundred or more of these little cell cups on there, and you need to have lots of nurse bees to raise these, to, to feed these and to make the wax and build the comb around them. <coughs> There's lots of devices and little contraptions that you can use. And then, oh, there's one of those bars I was talking about. Here's Dave holding, look at all these queen cells. And look at all the attendants on the bees, on the queens. Those are a bunch of queens that we raised. And here in the class that we had, we raised all these queens. And so they all got to take home their queens. Put them in their colonies if they want to. Any questions? Go ahead. You know, so the methods that you showed, do they change any at all when you're dealing with a different type of hive, like top bar hive or Different equipment will require different techniques, definitely. Uh, a top bar hive is going to be tricky for doing some of those, like a queen excluder or, but you can still take frames from the top bar hive and put them into another top bar hive, bar hive and use it that way. But just some, you know, some of the methods would be, you have to tweak them a little bit to suit the equipment. So if you're going to get one of those queens, you need to have a nucleus or something, right? You right. Right. So what we do then is we sell these. We we, we raise oh lots and lots of queens. If anybody needs a queen, you know, from like May, June, July, we have queens. And when you come to the meeting, we sell them. Uh, I think they're two dollars for queen rearing club members, which cannot be. And we try to raise queens. We we try to uh, raise the queens that are showing a propensity to thrive in this area. So we don't want the bees that, you know, are standing around shivering or, you know, get wet or don't go out and fly in the, the rain. You know, we want friendly bees. We want bees that forage well in poor weather. Um, bees that fly in the cold, you know, that sort of stuff. Uh, bees that are not hot all the time, there, there's, you really can't say too much about that. <laughs> and they've got lots of stings. So yeah, we sell these queens in the summertime, and if you need queens, you know who to call. Can you believe the queens that you're raising and nobody needs them? Oh, we learn on them. We practice all kinds of terrible things on them. So we have a really exciting learning program. We do some fascinating cutting-edge stuff. We are now artificially inseminating our queens. I should back up. We are now attempting to artificially submit our queens. <laughs> we have had uh, some practice and some failure, <laughs> but we keep trying and we're going to get it. Um, so we have nice little microscopes and I wish we had a picture of our, our little device, but it's a, it's a little machine that you, you put the queen into a little tube and then you stick her on some CO2, so she kind of gets mellow. And then you open up her back in and inseminate her with the semen that we collect from drones. So we need a lot of drones to do this. And we need a lot of queens to do it because we're not very good at it. So we have to practice it. Uh, but it's fascinating stuff. And uh, 
The, so what I was saying about bringing bees up from California and expecting them to thrive here is not realistic. So one of the things we like to choose for is bees that have overwintered two or three winters here. So, so we would choose the larva from a queen who has shown an ability to live here. And if you keep doing that, you come up with bees that are much more, uh, much better equipped to survive here. <coughs> yeah, the bees that are coming in um, on the 18th, where are they coming from? California. <laughs> Almond <laughs> flow. <laughs> the other question I had was uh, you, you mentioned that you're a member of the beehive place or a member yeah. of the queen ring. The, how do we do that? I think it's the queen ring club. You get a $2. Yeah. Uh, they sell the sells for $2, and I think the queens we were selling for. I, I thought they were reading and doing well, they were telling that. Yeah, I think so. That sounds right. <coughs> yeah. And so, the, so we sell them for four, if, the, the, if you're not a member. What's that, Joe? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, basically the, the big step is that the queen successfully been made it in issue A or issue not, okay? Right. And that's where the price jump happens. Right. Um, you, you probably will not get a commercial person who very clean who will sell you an unmade queen because of the you know, likelihood that she may or may not be. But the nice thing is in the club you can just you can get queens for cheap because you know a, a queen not only runs twenty bucks, so like, you were selling for two, you know, two to five bucks. Yeah. Actually, so is there another part of the club that we are in the club? Yep. Yeah. And we meet and do all this microscope uh, stuff and is that the part of the class, the one of the class that does not there? Yeah. 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 If you signed up with Elizabeth, that's yes. Yeah. How can you tell if a queen is made it? Because she's producing eggs. Oh, yeah. yeah, and you would look for certain characteristics. You know, you would look for the brood pattern and you know various things to determine if she's good or not. Because not all queens are equal. You, you you missed it back here. Oh, what's that? She's smiling and smoking a cigarette. <laughs> Jerry, about four inches. A little higher? A little higher, please. How's that? That's good. Is that good? I wanted Jean to Can go hear higher. Me? I wanted Jean to go higher, but she had nothing to hook it to. Can you hear me? <laughs> Can you hear, you hear me now? Yes. yes. All right, good. Um, any questions before I start about hunting? Yes. Oh. Not that question. Anyone else? <laughs> go ahead. What? Yes. How do nectar and pollen affect the honey? How absolutely exciting. That's a great question. Nectar and pollen, how it affects the honey I get? Well, I do. It's all in there. And that's what I sell. Now, I sell, I market all my honey. Last year, I had a pretty good year. I did about 400 gallons of honey. And um, I'm right now at about 200 gallons of honey. I got to sell. I'll be selling it bulk by by June if I don't sell it all my customers. I'm just going to sell it all bulk at a little discount. But my honey, I sell it raw, and uh, it has all that stuff in there. Has a nectar, which is probably 80 percent of what makes the honey. Oh, probably more than that. Probably about 99 percent, and about a couple percent there's pollen. In there. 
So my honey, I don't filter. I filter it in a real coarse filter because one of the things about my honey that I like to preserve is uh, a lot of commercial play. This, first of all, let me, let, your, your question though, my honey, which I sell as raw honey, is full of the nectar from the flowers. And I can normally tell my customers the flowers that came from. I am, I really am good at dendrology and my flowers and I identify and I walk around where my bees are, I go look at what they're bringing in, I look at the pollen they're bringing in, and I know the nectar. I study, I like to study it. So I like to know the days like today I'm at work, and it was a nice day today, and I know that they're bringing nectar from that, that maple. I know that. Um, maybe they're bringing a light, a light yellow pollen, but I know they're bringing in pollen from Scotch broom. I know they're bringing in pollen from dandelions. Um, and there's some other flowers out there that are probably bringing pollen in from too. different colors. And that pollen's in the honey too. If I use a real fine filter, the clarity of my honey is a lot clearer. But a lot of my customers don't like that because they uh, probably sixty percent of my customers buy my honey for allergies. At least sixty percent, and they swear by it. And uh, one minute, we'll get right to it. So they, I I use a coarse filter, and I tell them it's got a, you look at my honey and it's not real clear. It's, I mean it's real clear. It's beautiful looking honey, but it's got stuff floating on top. And usually it's little particles of wax, a couple of BIs, and some bee parts. And I don't charge them. They, they don't talk to them. I'm just joking. Yes? Is it raw honey or raw? I mean, what's, what's it? What, if it's not raw honey, what is it? It's filtered, super filtered. That's a great question. Now, if you read their magazines, if you read the, if you study, there is a um, there is a committee in the United States. It's a honey, uh, what's the name? The honey producers, the honey, yeah. honey board, and the honey board follows countries like China that launders honey. They laundry honey, honey, through like Argentina or Brazil. It's a huge big deal because it affects the price of honey in the United States for beekeepers who do honey. And uh, what they do, to make it real short, so what they do, now in a country like China, they have no federal regulations. So they can medicate their bees with whatever they want to medicate. They can medicate their bees with stuff that inundates the honey and is harmful to humans. This is bad. And they can, they'll filter their honey, so it's beautiful, clear looking honey, and they'll ship it to, they'll, they'll have deals with Argentina, and they'll sell their honey down to Argentina. Some guy down there will buy their container, and I'm talking a big 40-foot container, lots of honey, thousands of barrels. They'll buy it, and they'll put Argentina label on it, ship it up here to USA, and they'll sell it to Baker's Honey or whatever cheaper honey. But they still sell it up here, which affects the honey prices in the United States. So there is honey, and I tell people, people, they'll, they'll buy honey, people say, well, I can yeah, I got that honey in Costco for $10. I said, well, where would it come from? I don't know. It just says distributed somewhere. You don't know where it comes from. My honey is local. It's raw. So is it all raw? It's, 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 I guess it's raw. But there are beekeepers, years ago, I know beekeepers who would feed their bees, feed them lots of feed, pull all the honey off, and they might even have love sugar water in that honey. And then extract it and sell it. Because they could make more money on selling it as honey. Even with the sugar water in there, because sugar is cheap compared to honey. Some people do that. I don't do that. Yes? If, if your bees are pollinating rhododendrons, does the his rhododendrons have um, a poison in strychnine? Well, my bees don't do rhododendrons. We, we've never had that happen in this country. There are there are art, there are uh, there are stories of it happening, particularly in Turkey. Bees don't like rhododendrons because they're too deep. They much rather let bumblebees take. There are there are a lot of flowers. Yeah. Fox clubs a good example. Bumblebees are the powerful yeah. bee. Out in the morning, early, and they're strong and powerful. Take you ever know what Digitalis fox club is? Mm -hmm. Honeybees don't do fox clubs. But bumblebees will, because they're so strong, they can get down in there and pollinate. Rhododendrons, honeybees don't do rhododendrons, they don't like them. Um, alfalfa. Now you hear a lot of people, beekeepers, take their bees into the alfalfa fields. They do it for the seed, certified seed for alfalfa. They have to pollinate alfalfa. Honeybees hate alfalfa. 
alfalfa is tricky because honeybee, but they learned, and a lot of the alfalfa growers hate honeybees in their alfalfa. Because the alfalfa has the way it's set up, the honeybee tries to they'll go around it and get nectar out on top, tripping it so it won't make seed. Really? Uh, but they make a lot of honey off alfalfa. Did I answer your someone's question about raw honey back there? It was all raw, so. No, it's not all raw honey. Heating it. It yeah, pasteurizing it. A lot of the big honey companies, if you can imagine, they're bottling, let's say, 10,000 bottles a day. Honey, when I extract my honey, in my room, I have a honey room, in my room I put about 80 plus degrees. And uh, when I pull my honey out, I get all my honey off the mountains, I bring it in, I stack it all up, It's I stagger all my boxes, it's 80 plus degrees in my room, it's real warm. And I, I extract it and I bottle and I put it in five gallon buckets, my urn barrels. And um, it's slow. But a lot of honey producers, a lot of manufacturers where they, where they mass produce, they bottle honey, they heat it up, which kills a lot of that stuff inside of it. So it's not raw anymore. And I guess that's what I should have said to begin with, is they heat it up at 140 plus degrees, so it's like water, so they can bottle 10,000 bottles a day to sell it. You're done. No more questions for you. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. What would you like? What was that? Are you are you subject to Oh no no, the lady behind me had a sex question and you didn't see her hand. No, I just a real quick question. There's a guy called Harley from Riverton sells honey. I buy it IGA. Is that raw? I don't know. Harley stuff is pretty good. I write a couple of them, but I don't sell them. I don't know. Hey, what are you gonna ask now? Really want reliable honey? People, people go. This guy here, if you want it in bulk, you know, if you're, if you're making me, you should do. <laughs> Are you subject to Washington State Department of Health regulations with the way you extract and bottle your honey for sale? That's a good question. Um, I've never been asked that before. Um, it's an agriculture product, so I'll tell you about honey. Honey is a really interesting. Uh, honey, actually, for my thesis and my master's degree, I studied honey. In the lab dryer, with my background is biochemistry. And uh, things can't grow. Honey, real honey, processed honey out of the beehive, bacteria, or fungus can't grow in it because it's, there's no water. When we say the bees are done working the honey, and one of the problems that people have, and I'm going to go through these slides because I'll, I'll touch on that topic because sometimes beekeepers get a little, a little impatient. And they pull their honey a little bit too early. And it makes a mess. Because it ferments. It does. It makes meat. It makes meat. So the Vikings learned about meat because it's natural fermentation. So let's say we got here. What am I going to talk about besides what I already have? Um, so whether you're a commercial or hobbyist, beekeeper who is selling honey, you need to be concerned about the quality of your honey. That's true. Um, I always taste honey. I, quite honestly, I hate honey. You know, I don't like honey. I'm tired of it. I hate sticky ants. I hate it on me. But I always taste it, and my honey is different every year. So it is, for me, it's exciting. Because when I extract my honey, I can separate my honey. Now, I used to, there used to be great blackberry flows, and I always liked my hives up before I shipped them. Because typically a hive full of, well, you, I, I use westerns, and a western 60 pounds. They get heavy on my trucks and that, and it gets lots, lots of gas. So I used to lighten up. Nowadays, the, the, the flows, and because where I live at now is becoming more residential, they're killing all the blackberries and that. So I move them up there. But the, the honey, the color, I look at the color of honey. And uh, light honey typically is, is, is a lot. I like light honey. I have some very dark honey. I have some honey that looks like molasses. It comes from the Japanese knotweed. It comes out of Wilkinson area. I put some hives up there. I had a friend of mine used to put hives up there. His honey, it looks like you can't even see through it. It's dark, dark, dark brown. Now, you asked your questions last time. Yeah, what? <laughs> Is it the nectar or the pollen that makes it lighter or darker? Both. Probably more than nectar, the flower. Um, I read articles about like buckwheat, there's certain flowers. Uh, you always see, you'll see a lot of clover honey, it's a very, very light honey. There are honeys, uh, alfalfa honey is very light. Uh, buckwheat's very dark. There's some other honeys that are very, very dark. There's some that are very light. Uh, Japanese knotweed makes a very, very dark brown honey. It tastes like molasses. I think it's disgusting. 
I had some customers that said, love it. And I have, I had five, I don't know, seven, eight beehives up in that area by Wilkerson. And I made, I think I got uh, 20 gallons of honey up there. And they, they, some people love it. They taste it and they like it. Good for cooking. It's great for cooking. You said something about 60% of your customers buy your raw honey for allergies. Correct. So, does the pollen like help develop a resistance to it or something? No, that's a great question. No, what the theory is, is that that honey has all the pollen in this area, in the honey. So your body is acclimated to that pollen, gets adjusted to it, so that when the pollen's flying around, your immune system has already been in, inoculated to that pollen. So it's kind of like a, uh, kind of almost like a vaccine. Hey, absolutely, absolutely. So you've been ingesting this pollen and this honey, and your system is getting used to it, so that when you're breathing it in, it already knows it. It's already got all kinds of little whatever it takes antibodies going to fight. And just, a, just something else, an observation. I, uh, I took a, a We're going to be a while. Okay. okay. <laughs> no, that's okay. Go on. Another so observation. I went to the University of Washington day for a doctor appointment, and there was all this flowers around, and it was amazing how much that smelled like meat. Right. And I, I wish I would have brought in. I have uh, boxes of pollen in my freezer that I sell to a lot of companies. They like pollen. Yes? Uh, I will bring some pollen to the next meeting so everybody can try it. Yeah, and it's interesting about pollen, and I should have said before, is that those little pollen baskets on the bees, right, where they collect the pollen, and that's what I capture in my pollen traps. And uh, the pollen trap will be, which are about this big, and they're full of little babies, and it's all different colors. So, and it, it's great, it's, it's interesting stuff. So let's move on here, my guys. Uh, let's say most people prefer mild tasting honey. I believe that's true. Um, so if you have honey which has a strong flavor, you should let the buyer taste it first. Typically, I a lot of my honey that's I don't like, that I don't sell, I feed back to my bees. Um, because honey can fermentate, I mix it up pretty thick, um, about 50-50, maybe a little thinner because I don't want to get stuck in it. And if they don't take the honey back in a day or two, I dump it. Because it'll ferment. You add honey, you take a, take a quart jar of honey, and you add water to it, it will ferment. It will ferment in a short time. Um, see, honey is always right. So, in this set, this part here is what I was talking about earlier. This means that the bees have reduced the content 18.5% or below. They sell tools to go and monitor the, how wet your honey is. That's very important. Um, my, I've never worried about it. I take, we call it, I've always called it when, done, when the bees are done working the honey. When they're done working it, they cap it. When it's capped, all the water's out of the honey. If you take that honey and too early, which a lot of beekeepers do, you take it out too early and you extract it and you bottle it, it's got too high a water content and it will ferment. Explosively. Terribly. It will make a mess. Especially if you sell it or give it away. And they put it in their house. And it's boiling all over. You don't ask about it. Yes? Me? Yeah. That's what the Vikings discovered me and my ancestors. Um, probably a few days later. But it starts to ferment. And the yeast and the bacteria start growing. And the fungus start growing. Making meat. Yes? I use my in-frame feeders. Same way to sugar water. Same way. There is another trick that I learned a long, long time ago. <coughs> but I, I use in-frame feeders. Um, Some asked about that earlier. And I, I just like my sugar water. But I only feed it to my really strong hives. Because it'll ferment in two days. It'll start ferment. It'll start bubbling. You'll see it bubbling. Just like if you were a, a make a beer, I guess, a beer, a wine, or whatever. It starts fermenting. Because there are natural yeast and things in there, and it will start. You can try to experiment. Put a little, put some honey in the cup, add some water to it, and let it sit out there. It'll start bubbling. It's got natural yeast and things in there to start activating. The catalyst in the honey. So, to track, uh, try extracting honey soon after moving it from the hives. Unsealed ripe honey will absorb moisture over time. Oh, that's something else too. Um, if you do pull your honey up, and you don't extract it, and you let it sit in a cool room, it won't turn to sugar. And I find my honey is always very interesting, because in my hot room, which right now it's 60 degrees, I have lots of honeys 
I have honey a lot of times, but I keep honey from all my different years. And some of my honey goes to sugar, some of it doesn't go to sugar. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of theories about that, about the lattice of the, um, uh, the crystals and that. Um, let's see, honey defined. The term honey as used here in the vector floral exudations of the plants, given sort of owned by honeybees, they with no affairs, and love their men. Okay, excellent. And keep it at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. That's important. And I do. I keep, I tell everybody, keep it room temperature, not the refrigerator, because they will finish it. Let's see here. Honey descriptions. While there is no official definition of raw honey, it generally means honey that has not been heated or filtered. I got lucky. Imagine that. According to the, F, the FDA, nutritious can be used in reference to the diet as a whole, not an individual food. There is no federal state definition of organic honey. Um, there is no federal definition of honey. I didn't know that. Um, there are no rules about the term natural. All natural, raw, blackberry honey, local wildflower honey. Okay, be very careful not, not, you cannot allow any antibiotic chemical, and, that, and that's important. I don't medicate my bees until I pull down my honey. Most medications that I buy, now I used to use formic acid. Formic acid is a natural organic acid. It comes from organ, uh, formic ants. When you squish the ants, smell it, that's formic acid. When they bite you, they excrete formic acid, that's what stinks. I use formic acid. For years, um, that's really hard on the queens and brood and that. Um, I use a new product last year. I also use um, I use hop guard. Um, you can buy that. That's pretty. It's messy. It's messy as all. But uh, in those areas, they won't contaminate the honey. But I don't put medication until I pull my honey off or the springtime before they start bringing in. Right now, there are no honey boxes on my bees. All everything they bring in is for them sows to get the queen laying eggs. I won't put a honey box on until. Probably the first, second week of June when the blackberries start to bloom. There's nothing right now before the blackberries that's going to justify to put boxes on to cl uh, start collecting honey. Because right now they have a box on top. I have mine are two boxes. The top box has about 50 pounds of honey, 30 pounds of honey, which is about three or four frames, five <coughs> frames of honey, and the bottom box is absolutely empty. Except for some, maybe some mice in there. And they'll start filling that up. And I'll rotate my box around so they'll bring in their uh, nectar from the, the maples. And maybe some huckleberry and whatever they can find out there. Um, natural, uh, honey will naturally crystallize over time. This does not harm the honey. To liquefy the honey someplace and blah, 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 blah yada, yada, yada. And that, that's easy there. Um, and a, what? Not the microwave. Not the microwave? No. Why not? This one? That'll, that'll basically give you, um, that'll give you non raw honey because it eats up. Oh, it'll, it'll, you're right. it'll heat it up and take yeah. all that good yeah, stuff. It'll heat it up. Yeah. 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 Does the, the waves, the micro waves? I ain't going um, there. Okay. <laughs> That's another class. That's the other class. Using the microwave on honey will destroy the amino acids. It does destroy the amino acids. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so here we go. Honey quality. If you must heat your honey, never allow the temperature to get above 130 degrees. Mm -hmm. Boiling honey or excessively heating honey over a long period of time will cause changes in flavor, viscosity changes, decreases in enzyme and yeast activity. And that's what it's talking about. So a lot of commercial honey places, that's what they do. They, they, they pasteurize it, but they heat it up to 140 plus degrees. Um, one of the things I find by heating honey up, it changes the color of it. My honey right now is, is so beautiful. It's, it's almost white like water. And I have people who just love it. And um, so, but by heating it, we'll change the color of the honey. We'll darken it up. Increases the amount of um, hydroxymethyl, that's a great one, <laughs> HMF, which is used as an indicator of heating and storage changes. Okay. Honey color and gray. So I suggest anybody here, if you want to have some real fun, and I used to do this, um, any honey in the fair. If you want, there's a kiss at fair. We will, fair. we will have a specific thing on how to successfully enter your honey. It is fun. It's cool. It's fun. It is fun. 
Um, so that, that takes special jars. Now, but these are all the honey colors. So I can't read these up here because it's kind of blurry. That's um, actually, this is, um, I don't know what that is. I can't. But so the, the, that is so true. Different colors of honey. But it depends on the flowers it comes from. And that color determines the flavor. Dark honey stronger, light honey lighter, uh, milder. So, what do we talk about? White honey, uh, extra white. And also, in the, um, I always look at the honey markets. Every month I'm looking at the cost of honey. The honey, the prices change. And it's based on the different parts. They, they have a, the big graph, and it's based on different parts of the country, United States. And even they cover Argentina, Brazil. China, um, Vietnam, and Cambodia is in there. It talks about the type of honey and the prices. So I look at that to see what my honey, what I can give my honey by sell it um, So, and then it all has to do with the, they, they, they base their prices are on based on the color, a light honey or dark honey. Uh, year in review. All right. I think I'm, am I timed out? Yeah. Any questions before I walk out of here? I was only joking. What? How would you sell your five gallon thing of honey for? A five gallon bucket of honey? Yeah. It depends. How much money do you got? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm going to ask that. I sell, I do a little bit of a discount. One, I, more, one more question, and we're going to take a five minute yes. break. Absolutely. If your doctor will not give you a prescription for it, do you have a recommendation for an doctor? Well, I would ask Chris, why would your doctor use it? Because he's not right. Oh, well, no, I, I can actually go. I, I don't have a doctor. I stay healthy because I eat honey. I get beast things. Um, no, I get my parents. I just go down. Where I live at, I go to the dog. You know, I go to the I just go to any doctor they give to me. So I've never had a problem getting it. So I just go to that closed out there. Okay, we'll uh, get back at uh, 21 hours. Thank you very much. <laughs>